I'm thinking about evangelism especially, it's a great song to start with. And we're going we're gonna to hold down the end of this song. I'm going to tell you to watch me. So be ready at the end. I'm going to tell you, all right? One, two, chorus. Three, four, chorus. It's pretty fast. All right, here we go.
through the fire of this life. I love that. That's, I wake up at night and I'm, I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about what are we building on? And I'm thinking about we can't, we can't suck, we can't do it two ways. Jesus said you can't have it both ways. We talked about the Sunday school today. Remember what Elijah said about Baal? Make up your minds. Hebrews, who are you going to serve? You know what you get when you sit on the fence? Splinters every time. Make up your minds. What are you building on? So, that scripture. You know, verse, nine, verse 19 goes on and talks about, um, and, and there's going to be there's going to be a test of fire, and then in eternity we're going to get we're going to be shown what lasted and what didn't. We're going to see what withstood the test of time. And then in verse 19, it talks about, uh, about how the wisdom of this world ain't wisdom at all. And how, how the world is not going to get it. And, and how what the, what the world thinks is wisdom is not. And how the world has always had it backwards. And how it's never going to get it straight. And so we walk with God. Amen? We build our life with God. So, I love this song. Never done it before. Miranda and Preston have been so patient and diligent with me. I do love it. You're going to stay seated. Miranda's going to help you lead it. And it's so good. But you know what's always happens to me? I get so emotional. Woo! All right. Would you start the intro, baby? And we're going to go sing with you. You sing it.
to get you to say it. You know who that makes me think about, Rhonda? Meemaw. You think so, Troy? <coughs> Troy's grandmother. Y'all remember, <coughs> we called her sister Meemaw. Pentecost. All the way. We got to sing at her funeral, did we not? Sweet, sweet Meemaw. Uh, she was in our church many, many times. You remember Meemaw in the wheelchair? And uh, uh, she would have she would have loved that so much. All right, we're gonna have to stand because we're gonna sing "We Crown You." All hell the power. Another power song. All right, sing it with power. Stand up with power. None of you look Pentecostal at all. I just all right. Keep, keep going, Randa. Do it again. I'll, I'll jump in. That was not a dig. I promise. Here we go.
if you sang, you may be seated. Next, my son-in-law is going to come. And in case you don't recognize it, I will go ahead and tell you because he told me. I can't ever remember. He's going to play the euphonium. You'll recognize Randa at the piano. I was so very thankful for his willingness uh, uh, to play and to bless us uh, always, always, always. So glad his mom is getting to sit out and enjoy.
Thank you so much, Preston. I'm not sure there's any instrument that this man can't play. So talented. All right, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me now to the Old Testament, to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17. And we will begin reading with verse 1. 1 Kings 17 beginning with verse 1. And as we continue our study of the prophet Elijah, I want to share a message with you entitled, The Pathway to Power. 1 Kings 17, 1, you stand with me in reference to God's Word. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kirith, what that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to, unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Kirith, that's before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. You may be seated. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we pray that all glory for everything that's said and done today would be yours. Father, just teach us from your word. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Over a century ago, the great British expositor, F.B. Myers, wrote a little book entitled Elijah and the Secret of His Power. And in the introduction to the book, he said that there is nothing the church today needs more than spiritual power, and he said there is nothing which we can have so freely if only we're prepared to pay the price. Now you think about that. We can easily, he said, have spiritual power if we're willing to pay the price. You see, God's blessings and God's power are freely given, but only to those who want them badly enough. And I think therein lies the answer to the question, why does there seem to be such a difference to the Christian lives today and those of the men and women of the biblical days? I mean, as you read the Word, you can't escape the fact that there was a power in those folks' lives that apparently seemed to be missing in our lives today. And it's not that they were a different caliber of people. They, they weren't. The, the Apostle James in, in chapter uh, 5 and verse 17 describing Elijah said he was a man subject to like passions as we are. In other words, no different from anyone in this auditorium today. But the thing that set Elijah apart from every one else was that he was a man who was willing to do whatever it took in order for God's power to rest upon his life. Again, God's blessings, his power are freely given, but only to those who want them badly enough. And if the life of Elijah teaches us anything, it is that God delights to use men and women and pour out his power upon them whose hearts are fully his. And this is what I want us to look at in our time remaining. I want us to examine this man's life from these verses of Scripture and try to determine exactly what it was that enabled him to have such power with God. Now, as we look together at these verses, there are three things that I want to call your attention to. Three specific things that Elijah had in his life that those of us who are Christians 
today need in ours. What are they? Well, the first thing that we see is that Elijah was a man who had a proper conception of God. He had a proper conception of God. Look at what the word says, verse 1, Elijah the, the Tishbite, who was of in the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my work. Elijah had a proper conception of God, and his conception was that God is alive, as the Lord God of Israel liveth. Now, why is that important? It's important because no one else apparently in those days believed that. Elijah was perhaps the only one operating on the scene who had a deep-seated conviction that God was truly alive. And may I say unto you that things aren't a whole lot different today? You say, what are you talking about? I believe that God is alive. It's one thing to believe that God's alive because the Bible says it is. It's another thing to know that he's alive because of what he's doing in and through your life. See, a lot of people today believe God's alive. They just don't believe that he's awake and alert to all that's going on. But you see, Elijah had such a conception of God <clears throat> that he was able to stand before King Ahab and say, I am here as God's representative. And I want you to know he is aware of what's going on. And Ahab, if you think that God is going to continue to allow you to lead the people of Israel astray with all of your idolatry and immorality, you've got another thing coming. He's not. You see, Elijah knew that God was still in control of everything that was going on in the world. And as Christians today, we need that same conception of God. While Everything in, in the world around us seems to be spiraling out of control. We need the blessed assurance in our heart that God's still on his throne. Yeah. That he's still in control of everything that happens. And though the powers that be may seem to be leading our nation today further and further away from God, we know that he's going to have the last word. And so that's the first thing that we see about Elijah, was that he had a proper conception of God. Here's the second thing. Not only did he have a proper conception of God, but he was a man who had a proper commitment to God. He had a proper commitment. What we're going to see as we go through this is that there was an established pattern of obedience. To his life. And before we go any further, let me, let me just say something. You know, I, I, I believe that there are some people that God can trust more than others. I mean, you take, for instance, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. Paul said, I, I thank my God that he thought me worthy, indicating there were others that perhaps he didn't consider to be worthy. Not that God shows favoritism. He does it. It's just that he has more confidence in some folks than he does in others. See, that's why he says things to some people that he doesn't say to others. I mean, for instance, you take the example of the incident where God was about to destroy the cities of Sodom. And Gomorrah, do you remember what he said before he brought judgment upon them? He said, how can I do this and not tell my servant Abraham? You see, Abraham had established such a relationship with God that God felt comfortable confiding in him. So how does a relationship such as this come about? Only one way. By Obedience. By being obedient. And that's the way it was with Elijah. Because again and again, 
You find it like in verse 2, the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, verse 5. Elijah did according to the word of the Lord. There was a pattern of commitment to his life. But there's something very important that we need to be aware of, and that is that such a commitment to God and such a commitment to be used of God sometimes brings about a very severe cost. The Bible says that Elijah, because of his relationship with the Lord, was able to shut up the heavens so that it would not rain for the space of three and a half years. But God said, don't worry, Elijah, I'm going to take care of you. You go to the brook here, and I'm going to send the ravens by each day to feed you, and there'll be plenty of fresh water for you to drink. And Elijah did as the Lord told him. And sure enough, it happened just as the Lord said. And verse 6 said, The raven brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Those ravens came right on schedule. And that brook with its clear, cool water refreshed him from day to day. But verse 7 said, It came to pass after a while that that brook dried up because there had been no rain in Okay. See, one day Elijah looks up and he, he notices that the brook is running a little slower than usual. And the next day it was even slower and shallower until finally one day it completely dried up and he found himself out of business. You know why? Because of his commitment to God and his commitment to prayer. What happened was he dried up his own brook. See, what I'm saying is that his commitment to God cost him something. And we don't have the time to really delve into it any deeper. But what I want to ask you is simply this. Are you so committed to God that if you knew your obedience was going to cost you something, would you still maintain it? I was talking, this has been a number of years ago. Pastor friend of mine, really more just an acquaintance of mine, and he he said, I, I, "There's something I want to talk to you about." He said, I, "I'm facing a delicate issue in my church," and he explained what it was. One of the prominent families in the church had a son who was a practicing homosexual. He was a an accomplished pianist. And he was coming to visit, and the family wanted to know if the Sunday night while he was there, he could put on a mini concert for the church. And so he asked me, he said, what do you think? And so I, it seemed obvious. I, I, I shared with him what I thought. And he said, I, I understand what you're saying. But he said, if I do this, I'm going to lose this family. They're going to leave the church. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. That was the end of the conversation. I don't know how it came out. But just from the way he was talking, I imagine he went ahead and let the guy play. But see, here's, here's the thing. We cannot expect God to bless us if we're not going to honor his word when we know what that word says. See, the problem this pastor was facing was that if he was obedient to do what he knew God was calling him to do, it was going to cost him. But folks, let me tell you something. True obedience is always like that. It was for Elijah. First of all, he lost his book, then he almost lost his life. But here's the thing. If we're going to know true power in our lives, then there must be, on our part, a proper commitment to God. We must be willing to be obedient to the Lord, regardless of the cost. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, the days are coming when it's going to cost us. If we stand for God and if we're obedient to God, it's going to cost us something. Well, let me give you the third and last word. Not only must there be a proper conception of God and a proper commitment to God, 
There must also be a proper communion with God. Proper communion with God. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 18, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, Go show thyself to Ahab. In other words, stand in public and speak for me. But look at what verse 3 of our scripture said. God said, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself. See, the command, hide thyself, came before the command, show thyself. If you want to know why Elijah's public life was so effective, it's because his private life was effective. Before he was able to stand before King Ahab, he first of all had to stand before Almighty God. You know, one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 1, and I especially love verse 3 that says he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaves shall prosper, and, and all that he, uh, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And in other words, everything that he does, he's going to be successful at it. And I, I think that's a picture of what all of us want for our Christian lives, but See, what you have to understand is you can't begin at verse 3. You have to begin with verse 1 that says his delight is in the law of the Lord and in that law that he meditate day and night. You see, the fruit's there only because he's been meditating in the law of the Lord. Before there can be abounding, there has to be abiding. You see, in, in our scripture before us, God said to Elijah, I want you to go by the brook. I've commanded the ravens to feed you. See, what he was saying was, I, I have to minister to you before I can minister through you. And I think that's where most people are missing it today. Most people are trying to abound, and yet we've not been abiding. And, and nothing's happening. And that's, that's the reason. And let me say that's why... Uh, that's what's wrong in so many of our churches as well. You know, we're, we're putting all the emphasis upon abounding and leaving the abiding out. You know, it's Baptist. We're, we're famous for coming up with all of these different programs and campaigns and evangelistic efforts. And that's good because we need to be doing these things. But they must not have priority. They mustn't have priority. In order for God to bless these things, we have to be abiding. Amen. Spending time with God. Because if we don't, the only results we're going to see is what man can accomplish, and that's absolutely nothing. I mean, I want you to just think about it. Look, look at what we have before us as a church. A week from today, we're having this community block party where we're trying to get to know the people in the community and let them get to know us. And, and that's a wonderful thing. And then two weeks later, uh, we're going to be having a revival with Brother Herman Kramer and Dennis Ivey. Two weeks after that, we're going to be having vacation Bible school where we're going to be bringing all these children in and trying to reach them with the Word of God. And, and there's been a ton of planning that has gone into these events. And, and for that we give thanks. But we, unless we preface these things by spending much time with God, we're not going to see His power come to pass. Aren't you tired of only seeing what man can do? I am. I, I want more than anything else, to see a mighty move of God on this church and on the lives of, of his people. And the first step is to have a proper conception of God, that we believe that he is alive and that he's still able to do whatever he wants to do. And then we have to have a proper commitment to him. We have to be willing to do whatever he asks us to do. There's still a sign-up sheet looking for drivers. There's still things that we, we're going to need, and, and that's important. And then finally, and most importantly, there has to be a proper communion with God. Now, I want to ask that if possible, 
each and every one of you be here Wednesday night for a prayer meeting time. Generally, we'll have this many in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we'll have a third of that. But if we expect God to pour out His power upon what we have coming before, it's going to take time spent in prayer. And our Bible study and, and prayer meeting time is going to be different Wednesday night because we're going to be spending our time praying that God would pour out His blessings upon these three events that we have coming up. You see, you, you want spiritual power in your life? You can have it if you want it badly enough. The problem is, many, many people say they want it. They're just not willing to do what it takes to see it come to pass. I pray God would teach our hearts. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for what you're you have in store for us. And Father, I pray that we would follow your pathway to power. Not what, not what we say, not what we plan for. But Lord, we'd be willing to do whatever it takes for you to work in and through our lives. And so Father, we just give you this time. And we ask that you would be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You stand with me. We're going to sing our hymn of invitation. And if the Lord spoke of your heart, I want you to come. I just want you to be obedient today to do whatever God is leading you to do. And maybe you just need to come to this altar and ask God what you want to do. Whatever it is, you, you come. Yeah.